but help him to improve and protect his possessions and income. You know, the one thing, the one thing I'll say, Romans 10, faith comes from hearing. Hearing is an active thing. If I choose not to listen, if I choose not to hear, that's an issue. Faith comes from hearing. If I don't take an active role, if I get distracted by things, no matter what it is, if I get distracted, if I talk, how am I going to hear what I need to hear? I won't hear what I need to hear. And so then I just ignore. So then at the end, if you didn't listen your whole life, and then you get up there and God's like, you didn't listen. You had all these opportunities. You had Ignite. You showed up there. You had an opportunity. I didn't know what you were talking about. I didn't know. Dude, I, I gave you multiple opportunities. You made a choice. You made the choice. It's not God's move. It's your own. It's your own. So it's your choice. Faith comes from hearing. And it's just listening. That's, that's our active role. That's our level of measuring it. All I have to do is just listen. And then the Holy Spirit does all the work. That's all it is. So just listen. And hear. You shall not steal. It's relatively important. So we look at this. You know, whenever you look at this, it, oh, you've gone, been going through the Ten Commandments. Do you notice there's a positive and a negative side to the Ten Commandments? Do you see the positive and the negative? You should not fear. You should, not, you should fear and love God so that I don't take our, my neighbor's possessions. That's what you think. You shall not steal. Don't steal. Don't take other people's possessions. And we leave it there. But look what, look, look what uh, Luther is saying. But look at the end. But help him. It's not that I don't steal. I actually help him to improve and protect his possessions and income. So there's, there's the sins of, and I'm going to get a little technical here, but in this, right in here, in every commandment, there's sins of commission. What does the sins of commission mean? What do you think it means? I underline the key to start it, to give you a hint what it is. Do you know what the sins of commission are? Does anybody know? Sins of commission. Any youth know? Adult? Sins of commission? Sins you commit. I steal. I commit it. I commit. I steal something. It's things I've committed. So now here you go. So things you commit. What do you think the sins of omission are? Things you don't do that you should do. Things that I omit. I don't do them. We're, we're on the hook for the things that I commit and the things that I know that I'm not supposed, that I'm supposed to do and I don't do them. I'm not supposed to steal. So I don't steal. But I'm also supposed to protect and improve my neighbor's possessions. So when, when Paul makes something very significant, he says, I'm free from the law. And I'm going to get technical. I'm free from the law. He's not saying, I, you shall not steal. Paul's like, you know what? Not only do I not steal, I actually now have a power source of the Holy Spirit to help my neighbor improve his possessions and protect them. I have this ability now. And I'm free. I'm not worried about whether I'm going to steal. Not only am I not stealing, I'm going the extra step, and I'm actually helping my neighbor protect his possessions and his income. And to Paul said, that's freedom. That's life. That, that's, that's so important to Paul. Paul's like, I now have this ability to do this. The power of the Holy Spirit. We say that Christ is in us. Paul says it over 120 times in all of his epistles. Christ is in me. The Holy Spirit that dwells in me. There's now a power source we all have. Those that went to generate last year. There's a power source we have. The Holy Spirit. So not only do I have to worry about not stealing. I can actually take measures to protect my neighbor. And improve their possessions. It's, it's, it's significant to what Paul's trying to get at. There's one other thing that I wanted to say when it's about stealing. Which is rather ironic and I wanted to touch on it. Do you know that no matter what culture you're in. Not one. It doesn't matter. Anywhere in the world. If you take somebody else's stuff, the other person knows right away. If I go up here and I steal Mr. Drew's pen, everybody in here knows, hey, this is my pen. Everybody in here right now knows, I, dude, you just stole Mr. Drew's pen. It doesn't matter what culture. It doesn't matter even if they know about God or not. They know it's stealing. It's wrong. It's mine. You can't take what's mine. The, the adults in this room have seen the old thing. They have the cavemen. And they're up there, right? And they're, they, someone steals their stuff. And the guy, you know, <laughs> and he's mad because the guy stole it. So even he knows. It's interesting how even Hollywood says. And Paul says something significant in Romans. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law, they don't know about God. They don't know about the Ten Commandments. 
By nature, they do what the law requires. They don't steal. They are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They don't, have ten, they don't even know about the law. They don't even know about the Ten Commandments, but they know stealing is wrong. They show that the work of law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness. I won't read the rest. But he's saying even God has put a natural law into man. It doesn't matter. You ask an evolutionist, why is that the case? They don't have an answer. They don't know. Why is it, no matter what, an aborigine who's never heard of God, you go there, they know, you can't take my stuff. They, all, they know in their heart, killing isn't quite right. You go into Africa, there's a whole section in Africa where they sacrifice their children, especially if it's a female. They sacrifice. And there's Christians that have built, and it's about a two-day walk, and they have built, and they, it's an orphanage, where they'll take in the children. The mothers, who they've been doing this for hundreds of years, they've been doing this practice. And the mothers will take and secretly bring their female daughters to the orphanage. They know, even though this is their culture, they know this isn't right. And they drop off their females, knowing when they go back they could be in serious trouble for taking that child away, because this is part of their sacrifice. But somehow innately, that woman knows Killing my child is not right. It's innate. It's a natural law built into, built into every man that every man knows. They may not have the Ten Commandments, but they know it's not right. And stealing is one of them. We're talking about stealing here. So what shouldn't we steal? What are some things we shouldn't steal? What shouldn't you steal? Pens. You shouldn't steal pens. Money. What are some other things we shouldn't steal? Time. Time. Whose time? Others. Others time, we'll get into that. Stealing other people's time. Anything else? There's some things that are in here and we're gonna go through that maybe you haven't thought of. Anything that doesn't belong to you? Yeah, anything that doesn't belong, that kind of blanket, yes. What are some things that don't belong to you? Uh, like books. Books. Have you ever thought of, when time was brought up, being lazy or sloppy when working at employees? That's written in the catechism, Luther. Even being lazy or sloppy with your employer. Why would Luther say that? Why, why is that stealing? It's their time. I'm working for them. Doesn't matter if you're being mistreated. Doesn't matter. I'm not working hard. I'm not working. I'm stealing the time. I'm stealing. And Luther... Oh, Paul says this in Colossians, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. This is Paul. Work as if you're working for the Lord. Work heartily from your heart. Knowing that you're serving the Lord Christ. He wants us to work. Work is a big part. It's all over the Bible. I'm going to work. So just not even working hard, not even doing that is stealing. Is that a concept that maybe I never thought that that was stealing? But that's the whole concept. I'm going to work heartily. God wants us to work. Even if your employer isn't treating you right, I work. Why? Because I'm working for the Lord. I'm not working for men. That's a... That's a Difficult thing to do, even as an adult, to do that all the time, all right? Especially if we're being mistreated in any way. What about acquiring goods by dishonesty or fraud? Think that's stealing? Do it by fraud? Think that's going a lot in, on in this world today? Hedge funds, stealing people's pensions, taking it so they, for they can get their own wealth, live the way that they want to live. What about this one? I don't know if I put it on there. Let me see. I'm going to go back one. What, well, yeah, what are ways we look after our neighbor's well-being? What are some ways we can look after it? Okay, that the negative, I'm not supposed to steal. I'm not supposed to steal. I'm not supposed to do certain things. Now, how can I look after? What can I actively do to look after? We're supposed to do this, but how would you do it? How would you look after your neighbor's income and their well-being? What could we do? What are some practical things that we could do? Neighborhood watch, protect their goods. Yeah, I didn't even think of that one. That's a good one. Some other ways you can protect your neighbor's stuff. 
Never would watch. It's really good. Oh, there you go. Well, you're doing it. Nice. Nice. Anybody? Some of their stuff blows in your yard or something in a storm, help. They go over there and there maybe was damage to something, you help them out, protect their goods. Yeah, protect them, have, have an interest in your neighbor, make sure others aren't, right? Help them out. Help their income. Maybe that might be, hey, I'm a little bit behind in a payment. If they ask you for a little bit of help, you help them out. Philippians 2 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. This is this that whole section. It's not just about us anymore. It's about looking out not just for your own, but for others' interests. This this is now. This, this concept wasn't out before. I don't believe at all. There's nothing that I can ever see in the Old Testament. Now with the power of the Holy Spirit, that wasn't being done. If you can read enough old literature that isn't from the Bible, then you can read enough of how it was before Christ came and before we had the Holy Spirit come in, after he ascended and then he sends the Holy Spirit. Prior to that, you can read enough of the right, how, what it was going on. You can read all the Greek philosophers. You can read about Roman culture the way it was. They were not thinking about it. They only thought of their own interests. If you did something to me, I could say I forgive you, but don't worry about it. My anger is going to seethe against you. And if it took 20 years for me to get my revenge, just fine. And if you did something to me 20 years ago, and I turn around, and I waited 20 years to get my revenge back on you, and I stood before the Roman Senate and said, you know, this is what he did to me 20 years ago, and everybody knows it, you were justified. So you could let your anger seethe for long periods of time. You could read this from your own from Roman people that were writers that wrote that this is the way the culture was. The Holy Spirit comes along. Now I have an ability to actually not just think of my own interests. We have the ability to think of other interests too. And a lot of people do this. We do this in many ways. Every single one of you have thought of other people's interests. Maybe we don't do it as often as we should, more than likely. But this is the positive side of the, of the commandment. I actually have the ability to do the positive side. The things that I don't do. So if I'm not doing these things, there should be no reason. If I'm not interested in other people, and if I'm not interested in their interests, I don't care what they have to say, that would be sin of omission. Because I'm supposed to be able to do this. With the power of the Holy Spirit, I can do this. The rest of my life, work to try and improve not just my own, but others. It's both. Okay? Now, here's an interesting question. What are some things that we blur the lines as being our neighbor's property or possession? There's some things. There's some things that we kind of blur the lines and we don't really think whether it is or isn't stealing. And it's been, it's more of a more of a thing that's come up, I'd say, within the last 20, 25 years. The older, older ones, Napster, copyrighted music material. Movies. Taking movies and making copies of it and selling them. Stealing. It's not yours. It's copyright. It's their copyright. It's their material. We don't think of it, right? What about on the internet? You guys are all older now. Plagiarism, you know what, who knows what plagiarism is? Plagiarize. It's not your material and you quote it word for word. It was much more difficult for a teacher to catch when I went to school because they had to know the encyclopedia or know all the books. Now on the internet, all those books are on there, they can click. They can put one of your whole sentences that you put in a report, whether you're in high school or college, especially if you're doing a research paper in college, they can just do a whole line, throw it right in the search, and see if that matches any, any book. Plagiarism. It's not your thought. If you're going to use a thought in a paper, and it's not your own thought, source it. If you don't, it's plagiarism. It's not your idea. And you sell it off as, I came up with this idea. I thought of this quote. Plagiarism. And I just marked that down because heads up. It's, with the internet, it's much more difficult. What about patents? You patent, a material, you patent something and you come up, this is all over. People steal patents of other people, their ideas. 
But the first two, the CDs, movies, music, what about personal information now? Personal data, it's all the time. You gotta protect your personal identity. People steal your information. They get a hold of your social security card, get a hold of some information, they can wreak a lot of havoc. Has anybody's parent ever in here had their identity stolen? Has anybody ever had it done? I've known several, it's, it's, it's very, very difficult to recoup that. What about posting other people's pictures on your Snapchat? Posting a picture of somebody that you shouldn't. Maybe that doesn't turn into stealing, but once again, it's not your picture and you're posting it, putting it out there. There's a lot more temptations now with the thing, that little phone that's in your hand in computers that we don't think is stealing, but it is. And I, I've known a lot of friends that did movies in college they made copies of movies, CDs. Napster was huge. I had a lot of friends that got involved in that. Put a lot of, a lot of them in. I know one guy, one of my friends had to pay $8,000 fine for all the music he had downloaded from Napster. You guys don't even know what Napster is, do you? <laughs> it was, uh, but like before Apple's iTunes. Guys would just put CDs in, burn it, and then sell the songs. And you could get it. And you could share songs. So it was, it was free on the internet. So they cut it down. And the guys that had a lot of, he had over 200,000 songs on his computer, $8,000, or he had to spend, well, they, they threatened him with three years in jail. So, yeah. So he, did, he, never, he never even thought. He said it wasn't stealing. It's on the internet, so it's free. And because it's on the internet, I didn't do it, so I can take it. He didn't think there was anything wrong with it. It never crossed his mind that it was stealing. And a lot of people did it. And the last thing, all things are God's. We just use them. Everything's God's. We just use them. Anytime you want someone else to steal, it's all God's. We're just using them. This is all his. And we use them for the time that we're here on earth, and what happens? The Bible's pretty clear. We think we all are smart enough. It doesn't matter. The money, everything that we have, Eventually we die, none of it goes with us. So it just stays here for the next generation to use. And so we're just here on this planet, we're using it. We're using the materials that he gave. Everything we make is out of the materials God spoke into existence. It doesn't matter this building, everything. Everything that this building is, every, our homes, everything, our clothing, all built off material God spoke into existence. We just use it. None of it is ours. And it doesn't matter if it's my possession or if it's Mr. Drew's. That's his pen. And he's just using what God gave him, and he's just going to use it. But it's not mine. Because I'm just using it anyways. So don't steal. Don't steal. Don't use someone else's stuff. And there's a lot of different areas. All right, Eighth Commandment. Look at the Eighth Commandment. It has the same thing. This one, probably we break the absolute most, don't we? You should not give false testimony against your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, slander him, or hurt his reputation. But what should I do? What I should be doing is I should be defending him. Speak well of him, even my enemy, even the one that doesn't speak kindly about me, speak well of him and explain everything in the kindest way. Even the person that's really not a very nice person to me, that slanders me, that gossips about me, that tells things, I'm going to explain everything in the kindest way. Well, this is why this person is doing it, to explain it in the kindest way. This is a very difficult thing to do. Is it not? Especially if someone is stabbing you in the back, a friend, that you betrayed you with some information, and you shared something personal, and then they turn around, or they make fun of you, they slander you, they hurt you, they betray you. But this is the positive side. The only way that if somebody's doing that to me, the only way that I'm able to turn around and actually speak well of them is take it to the God in prayer, and he has to, the Holy Spirit gives you the ability to do it. If you are able to do this. I, I have, there are several people that I know that are able to do this. This is very difficult to do. To defend them, speak well of them, explain everything in the kindest way. Notice, there's the don't do. I'm not supposed to do it. But then there's the positive side. And that's what Paul is saying. That's what brings life. That brings value to me. That's what I'm free to do. Paul said, not only do I not 
to betray it. I'm going to speak everything in the kindest way possible. As Christians, we're supposed to admonish with love. Doesn't mean that we can never admonish someone, but you got to do it with love. What does love require of me? Somebody's slandering me. What does love require of me? Does that mean I just keep my mouth shut? Does that mean I just take it? Do I go to that person, speak well of them, but tell them? What does love require of me to do? Pastor just talked about in church what WWJD. Instead of what would Jesus do? Does that, when, who's that church? Do you remember what he said you should think of? What? Walk with Jesus daily. What do you do? He, did he admonish people in the Bible? You guys remember? Did he admonish the people in the Bible? He told the Pharisees the truth, didn't he? He was pretty blunt with them. He admonished them. He had love for them. But listen, you're not listening. Stiff-necked people. Yeah. John said that John called them brood of vipers. All right? So, yeah, you explain everything. What about this one? What are some ways we damage a person's reputation? Come on now. This one's pretty easy. We're all guilty of this one. Just admit it. Tell lies. Tell a lie about them. Gossip. It's big. Yes? That's a great point. Nope. Yep. Gossip's a big one. That, that's a great point. Even if it's the truth. Even if it's the truth, just gossip about it. We're supposed to carry others' burdens. We're supposed to put everything in the kindest way. If it's going to embarrass them, even though it's the truth, it's gossip. Put out thing. What, what, you post something on there. You're making public their faults. You're bringing it up there. One of the things that if it just happens between you and your friend and something funny happens or something happens that's rather embarrassing, keep it to yourself. You don't have to share it with anybody. Now, if that other person that act happened to them, they fell and they tripped and then they look kind of clumsy, and if they want to tell the story, fine. But I don't have to. I don't have to tell it. I'm going to cover it up. I'm going to pretend like it didn't happen. I'm not going to tell my friends, even though it was funny. I'm going to be quiet. Now, I know as, as males, we like to joke around a little bit. I think they do it quite a bit. Friends do it. It's a little different. But some friends, I know, don't like it. They don't like to be seen as weak. They don't like to be seen that they make mistakes. And you got to be careful who you do it with. Some don't care. But if I do something silly, fall down, or whatever, I don't really care if a friend says, man, he was walking, he just fell and tripped. I'd laugh about it, too, whatever. It doesn't matter to me. Some don't like it. You just got to know the person. All right? What's well, something else? Maybe you don't think of. What's another way, what's another way that you can uh, damage a person's reputation? Share someone's secret. Ooh. <laughs> That's a big one. Sharing someone's secret if you didn't hear it. Oof. Um, yeah, that's not kind. What's another one that maybe you don't think of? <coughs> What about rushing the judgment? Go ahead. Giving off personal information that they don't want to be shared. Yep, a secret or personal information. You gotta be able to trust when the other person you're talking with someone. What about rushing the judgment? You don't know their intention, you have no idea. There are people that maybe have you have no idea. Somebody guess what? Stereotyping. Ooh, stereotyping. That's not even in the catechism. Really good. Like I said, you rush the judgment. Anybody else? You have your hand up? Rushing a judgment. You don't know. You don't know the person's situation. You don't know. Maybe they're. Go ahead. Kind of going along with that prejudice. Prejudice? No. Stereotyping someone. Rush the judgment. You have no idea. You have no idea, and you go to some soup kitchen, you have, no, you have no idea how somebody was homeless and got in there. You have no idea. You just stereotype that what? You just made bad financial decisions. They don't care. They're drug addicts. And meanwhile, you have no idea that, you know what? They lost their job. They have no, they had no other way. They have no family. They lost their job. They had nowhere to go, and they ended up on the street. And that's a lot more than you think of. 
And then you just rush to judgment. You think, well, they're terribly financially sound. They didn't know when a series of bad things happen, and they end up on the street. And they, they don't no fault of their own. And then they lost their job, and they don't know what to do. And they have no family. And they just rush to judgment and just assume, ah, they're homeless. They've been this way their whole life. Irresponsible. Drug addict. It's rushing to judgment. You have no idea. You have no idea why this is. Now, are there a lot in there that probably fit that bill? Yeah, but you don't know which ones. And you just rush to judgment. Right? Complaining about others. Right? You complain about them. Even though you might be valid. Even though you might be valid to complain. You know, this person wronged me. And you have every right to complain. Yeah, you do. You have every right to be upset about it. In a human sense. But here, the commandment's saying, you know what? Just keep it to yourself. You don't have to share it with other people. You can maybe confide in one person complain, but it's just going to stay in that one person. We're not going to spread it around. you got to trust the person you do it. We do this quite a bit, do we not? I know I do it. Right? Complain about somebody else. And you don't know. You don't know the whole situation. You don't know. This is a tough one to do. The Eighth Commandment is a tough one to adhere to. This is something that could be a challenge your whole life. Your whole life. There's no way. And I'm not going to stand up here and say, oh, this is what it is, and I do it perfect. But by no means. Absolutely not. I'd be, I'd be a bold-faced liar. This is, a, this, is a very, this is a very difficult one to do. So let's say, okay, fine. I was I'm not supposed to damage a person's reputation. Here's the way to do it. But let's look on the positive side. Oh, let's go first here. Matthew 15. Forgot to put this on there. This is Jesus talking. And, and he called the people to him, this is Jesus, and Jesus said to them, Hear and understand, it is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? Jesus answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone, they are blind guides, and if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. And Jesus said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth, passes into the stomach, and is expelled? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. What comes out of my mouth, what comes out, that shows what's in my heart. What Jesus is saying. These are Jesus' words. These aren't mine. That's a scary thought. Wow. You use certain words I shouldn't use. I use the F word. I use other words. That's just whatever. But I know that they're, they're slang words, but they're also curse words. And that comes out. Jesus is saying that, that that's defiling you. And this is what comes from your heart. I hate you. I hate you. Ooh. That's right from your heart. You're, you're saying, man, man, my heart is that corroded, that dark, that I actually hate this person. That just came out of my mouth. Even though you think, I really don't hate that person, but yet I just said it. Jesus is saying, whatever comes out of your mouth defiles you. Whatever, and it all comes from the heart. Everything that comes out of your mouth. So I'm to speak well. If I'm gossiping, I want to gossip. That's in my heart. That's a heart issue. Understand. I say this, I said this to you guys before, I believe. Jesus' target is the heart. That's why he came. There's a problem with the heart. There's a problem with the soul. There's a problem with the will. Whatever word you want to use. The Bible uses heart. We would talk about the will. We would talk about the soul of a person. That's the inner part. There's a conscience and there's a soul and there's a will. And the target was the heart to change, to transform the heart. I, the last time I talked with you guys, I told you about Paul and how here was a guy that was murdering other people, dragging them out by their hair. Paul knew what it was like to have that hatred for other people. And he completely was utterly transformed. How? By meeting Jesus Christ and turning himself over to Christ and letting the Holy Spirit root this out. And it took a long time for Paul. I said to you, this is when I was here about a month ago. 
Paul didn't just all of a sudden just transform like this. He met Jesus on the road to Damascus. The Bible in Acts would seem to be that Paul immediately, right away, started on his missionary journeys. No. By the other epistles of Paul, he, he went somewhere for somewhere between seven to ten years. We don't know where. He went away. And that whole time, the Holy Spirit was working on him to root out these things, this evil way that he was. It takes time. This is not something that can be done right away. But this, I'm supposed to speak well and make sure this isn't coming out because what comes out of my mouth is right from my heart. It's a tough saying. It's a tough saying by Christ. So, all right. What can we do to speak constructively or positively about others? What are some things we can do? Okay, we're not supposed to gossip. We're not supposed to lie. We're not supposed to share secrets, okay? Well, what are some practical things we can do to speak well with somebody? Some things that we can actually apply going forward. To not bear false witness against somebody. What's something you can do? You can actively right now say, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work. Lord, help me do this. Can't do it on your own. You're gonna have to have God help you. You gotta pray. And you gotta say, God help me. I don't want to do this anymore. I know I gossip. Lord, help me stop gossiping. Help me. And not just stop gossiping, but do the positive side. What do you do? Speak well of them. Even an enemy, someone that's slandering you, it's tough to do, isn't it? That's tough to do. Especially when someone's just he's doing the exact opposite. He or she is doing the exact opposite. And will do nothing to help. Speak well. What's something else? Does everybody, everybody in the world always have negative qualities? Is everybody just a negative person? Even the person that slams it, do they not have any positive qualities you can talk about? Is there something positive you can talk about the other person? The person isn't completely 100% evil. Even if they don't believe in Christ, there's got to be qualities in them that are positive. I can speak well. I can speak well of their positive qualities. I can encourage it. If I want maybe people to stop, maybe instead of reacting and being quiet, maybe this is the key, don't you think? Did I do the positive side? If you're being slandered by someone else and being gossiped, being made fun of, turn the tables. The Bible says heap, heap coals on them. Speak well of them. Speak well and heap coals right on top of them. They know what they're doing is wrong. They know it's not nice. They know they're slandering. So then you turn around and I'm, I'm going to be speak well of them. I'm going to turn around and do the positive. From my heart, do it intentionally. From my heart, it has to be from the heart. It has to be on purpose. Not to get something for yourself. I, I want to do this. I want to be able to do this. And by doing it, I, hurt, I heap beat burning coals on their head. Because now what are they going to do? Speak well of them. How tough is that one? That's real difficult. How does your mouth shut? Is all you need to do for that? No. Yes. No. Don't react to it. No. I add something. No. To that, to that point. Mm -hmm. Be quiet. Right. Don't react. You can't say something nice. Like, I mean, I you can't. can't. But I just try to shut my mouth. Nope. Well, I, oh, right. that, my grandma taught that. So that way, you can't say anything nice. Don't say anything at all. One of the keys, guys, is to seek to understand someone's actions. Why are they doing it? Someone's slandering you. Someone's gossiping. Why? What? Why? What? What's the purpose here? What happened? You might, you might have offended them that you didn't realize you offended them and you have no idea. You have no idea. And maybe you offended them and it's really not your fault, but they were offended by something you did. Ask them. Try and understand someone else's position. Why? And then explain their actions in the kindest way. You don't know. We all react to things. We all react. We all take offense to things, right? There's personal attacks. 
And it's an offense, and it's a choice we make to get offended. We're offended by whatever, so we react to it. I'm well aware. I'm guilty of this big time. I'm trying to get better at just taking offense, and you don't know. And sometimes people take offense, and I didn't do anything wrong. You took offense at something, and I didn't even do anything. But they, for whatever reason, took it as an offense. Maybe the way I said it, maybe the way I talked. But I need to understand where their point of view is. But that's by having a conversation with somebody. Actually sitting down and talking with them. And a lot of things can be resolved. Matthew 18, that's what, that's what Christ says to do. Take it to the person. Go to the other person. And if they won't listen, then take someone with you. And if they still won't listen, then you take an elder, a leader of the church, and you go with them. And say, hey, but lots of times the problems can be resolved if you just talk and have a level of understanding with each other. And that's a difficult thing to do, especially at your age. I'm not, I don't know if I would have been able to do it at your age. Even though you're supposed to do it, I understand, I get it. It's even dif difficult when you go. But if you can start to learn at an early age and get better at it and ask God to help you and have that, and you might be nervous, the better off you'll be in life. You'll be further along than I am. Because I found it difficult and I was always chicken to do it. And now you have to have, I have to, doing what I do now, I have to have conversations with people. And I have to tell people no. People ask me all sorts of things that they want to do here at the church. And I have to say no and they take offense. Because you say no. And so you have to have a conversation. If I just leave it lay there, then people are upset all over the church. And that's a problem. So I have to have uncomfortable conversations. And I wish I would have learned this when I was your age and started to do that. Because I would have been better at having those conversations. But I need to understand their viewpoint why they want it, and they have to understand mine, and we have to come to agreement that, you know what, maybe we don't agree, but let's not be offended at each other. Let's still coexist and deal as Christians. It's difficult to do. I find it extremely difficult, even for me. But the Bible says what I'm supposed to do. And in there is life, guys. We you think, well, this is what I'm supposed to do. In there is where Christ says, in that is life. And when you do that, I'm right there with you. I'll give you the words, and I'll help you pray about it with the other person. People have come into my office. You pray about it first. You go. It, it doesn't 100% solve the problem, but it sure isn't contentious. It sure isn't like people are angry and leave angry and mad. You have a nice conversation. You just agree to disagree. And it's okay. But instead of turning it into a big argument. But that's a positive side. And Paul says that's life. Paul says that's what life is. That's what it looks like. To involve Christ in everything you do. This is the last, look at Ephesians 4. Rather, speak the truth in love. We are grow, grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, for whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Right now, you're all the body of Christ in here. You may be young. You're the body of Christ. You're a valuable member. You guys are all valuable members of Grace Lutheran Church. You have something to offer. It's not that you're young and you don't go and you're not involved. You play a valuable role. All of you can play a valuable role in everybody's development, mine. I've said this before. There's an exchange here. I'm growing at the same time you are. This isn't me just teaching and I'm just doing it. I'm just pouring out. I get stuff. There's been great comments coming back. I'm growing up and understanding things. There's an exchange, and it's the whole body. The whole body has to work together. And we can't tear each other down. That's what Satan wants us to do. He wants us to be contentious. He wants us to gossip about each other. He wants to lie. I'd still argue that I think, personally, I think gossip and slander and stuff happens more at a Christian school than it does at a public school. My son at Germantown says it's, it, it's totally different at Germantown than it was at Grace. Why? Satan's already got Germantown. He's already got the teacher saying a bunch of different stuff. Grace doesn't. And so the devil works extra hard, and we're sinners. And we fall into that. Slandering and lying. I've, I've seen and I know, I was involved in classes, the slandering and the lies, the gossip. Every year, my wife's been a teacher for 30 years. And she's telling the stories every year. And it hurts people, and it goes, it shouldn't be happening. We're the body of Christ. It shouldn't be happening. But it does, at an alarming rate. And it shouldn't, because I'm supposed to be doing the positive side. I'm supposed to be building up, understanding other people, talking well of them, even the people that don't speak well about us. And in there is life. 
It's quite unbelievable when you think about it. It's difficult to do. And you have to pray. You have to ask God to help you. You have to daily. You have to. If you just relax for a little bit, you'll fall right back into it. As will I. You've got to pray about it all the time. Last thing. Is this happening in our society today? Is there slander going on? We just had an election. Did you see that slander? Oh, my goodness. And it's all okay that I, that politician can fabricate a little bit of the truth, right? Because you really can't get them for libel because the election already happens. You can't, you can get, you just twist the truth a little bit, right? Just twist it. It's all okay. That's all political ads are now are slander. Christianity, are Christians slandered? This, this, is, this is an evil book. This is an evil book. Christianity must be shut down. This is evil. This, free, this speaks evil. Oh, really? You just heard today, I'm supposed to speak well of other people. And when people are slandering me, I'm not supposed to slander back. I'm supposed to speak well of them. Yeah, that's evil. We really shouldn't have that. Do you want to live in a society that does the positive sides of the commandment? Wouldn't that be a pretty great society to live in? That you just go to each other and you, yeah. But no, this is evil. we got to get rid of it. Yeah, they slander it all the time. Uh, one last thing. Are there times when not speaking the truth may be necessary? You think there's times? Not speaking the truth. This is in the catechism, actually. This is rather interesting. Are there times in which not telling the truth is necessary? How? Oh. So he, he, she would say that, uh, that there's um, a secret between two people. The other person wants to know one. No, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you the secret. Like you said before, it's to help your neighbor. If you don't want anyone to come to them, then sometimes a little white lie is fine. It's not even a white lie because you're protecting the other person. So the example would be during the Holocaust. Your heart, you got four or five Jewish people in your basement, and the Nazis come and knock. You harboring any Jews? If you tell them the truth, they're dead. What do you do? No, I'm not harboring anybody. I'm protecting them. There's times. There's even a story in the Bible in which it was, there's several, in which, you know what? No. No, because they knew that if they told the truth, there was going to be, somebody was going to be harmed. If you're, able, if you're going to protect somebody else, it's not your own interest, it's protecting someone else, and by saying it's going to protect them, yeah, sometimes it is necessary. And it's not, I wouldn't even call it a white lie. I'm just protecting somebody. Because I'm supposed to protect other people. I'm supposed to protect their interests. And have care and compassion for other people. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Sometimes, sometimes it's all, it is okay. But you got to ask. Is this one of those times? And people have, people throughout history have had to ask that question, especially during the Holocaust. No, I'm, not, I'm going to tell, I, I cannot tell the truth. And there's been other times that this happens. Right now, there's persecution. I went up, I had the high schoolers and the persecution in the Christians. How many people, how many Christians do you think live in persecuted countries right now? What would you guess? How many? How many? Look, how many would you guess? How many Christians live in countries in which there's active persecution? What would you guess? Thousands. Thousands. Anybody else? Higher? I would say about 25 mil. 25 mil? Anybody else? I think it's higher or lower than that. There's 360 million Christians that live in. We are unbelievably privileged right now. Unbelievable. You guys can gather right here. There's other, there's unbelievable. You, you can look at the chart. You, you can look at where it all is. Latin America, Africa. And they have to meet in private. So now what do you do when you meet in private? I gotta make sure that Ms. Wheeler, what if she gets caught? Is she gonna rat me out? Is she gonna rat me out? If she gets caught? Or if she's not careful while we're meeting and she shows up here and she's running in late to the gathering and she's got her Bible in her hand and the neighbors see her running? Like, well, what's going on? So I gotta trust that Jamie's gonna do her due diligence to make sure this is going on. 70 million Christians have been killed since Christ. Till now, 70 million Christians have been murdered. Rough guess. 35 million of them have happened right here in the 20th century. Communist countries. 
over 35 million. And they got to they live in shelter. There's some that are gathering your age, families. Now, what would you do? What decision would you make? Your parents are Christian. You're there, and you're like, well, I'm going to be a Christian or am I not? Am I going to be able to keep my mouth shut? Am I going to be able to keep a secret? Am I going to do this? Am I going to make a decision? Am I going to be a Christian? Because I might be persecuted. They're living by those things. I can't speak well. I have to be a community. I have to trust. Jamie and I can't be at odds if we're living at the going in a basement. We got to make sure that we're talking things out, and they do, because they know we can't have conflict here. Because if there's conflict, she may rat out the whole group. It's living up the positive sides. All right, all right, guys, you can go. Nice job.
can't look at this. They're all empty. I did. Yes, I did. Huh. Nobody wants to do anything, huh? Hmm. Well, I'll, I'll walk around. was going that's what that was before I made my statement
I had to clean a lot of chalkboards when I was a kid. Oh, yeah.